Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Cloud Wars Live. This is the podcast where we dig into the digital revolution that lately has been taking some crazy twists and turns, I think mostly for the good. Uh, one of the things coming up here is we're seeing, uh, although there's been over the past few years, certainly lots of talk about AI, we are starting to see its impact on our daily lives more and more, what that does to us in both our personal lives but all the, so the professional lives and perhaps um, new types of thinking and classification and future for people who uh, recently have thought of themselves as knowledge workers. Is that a safe haven or a risky place? Somebody who has some good thinking on those subjects, as always, and many others, is our good friend, Tony Uphoff, who is uh, part of the Acceleration Economy Analyst Network, a four-time CEO and all-around good guy. Tony, great to see you. Mr. Evans, always great to see you, my friend. Um, and if Tony can just resist uh, here during the NFL playoffs, is saying anything to me about the Pittsburgh Steelers, I'd be grateful. But, you know, he's his own boss. Well, we'll I, what, where he goes I, with I, that. I, not, to, not to belabor the theme, my friend, but uh, my, my hometown Los Angeles Rams, I believe, have posted the worst record of a defending Super Bowl champion in the following year in history. I believe. I'm not positive on that so I've got nothing to uh, to crow about. <laughs> Not that that usually stops him. But anyway, um, Tony, yes. a couple things here, though. Um, you know, we got these new, in some ways, threats and opportunities to the way we've yeah. traditionally thought about knowledge workers, or even traditionally, if you want to go back five or 10 years, 15 years. And then the other point that you had here, too, we've all heard about ChatGPT. I've said I think it knocked the Earth off its axis a little bit. You know, who knows if the Earth will ever get back on its rotation with this. But it certainly has had a, an astounding impact in its first couple months on the market. So as somebody who's run some pretty big organizations, led them through, you know, incredible in some cases, gut-wrenching, and other places, very exciting changes. What do you make of these things going on right now? And what are your observations as you talk to other uh, uh, thoughtful individuals about where this might be headed? Yeah, Bob, I think, you know, in, in to, to build the foundation here around kind of two themes, and I think pretty quickly, hopefully, the, the listeners will understand how these are connected, right? We're witnessing the biggest changes in what most people refer to as knowledge work since the, the term was coined some nearly 70 years ago today. Mm -hmm. And these changes are just remarkable. And in many cases, you know, it's like living through a revolution. You don't always know what was happening until you look back at it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that the average person really realizes how radically things are changing. And so knowledge work and the changing nature of what is knowledge work and, and then this, this phenomenon that seemed like it came out of nowhere, this generative AI um, engine called ChatGPT, which, uh, you know, what, Bob, two months ago, two yeah. and a half months ago? Yeah. Seen, in November. Right, like it came out of nowhere. And the next thing, you know, it's mainstreaming everywhere and it, everybody's talking about it. So l let me see in the setup here if I can kind of link these two, because yeah. I think they are really very directly linked. Um, the big transition in knowledge work, and for most people would understand knowledge work is fundamentally the idea that you're working on computers and you're, you're making decisions based on data and information and you're applying your knowledge to make business decisions as opposed to a craftsman that you're actually making something or building something through the use of machinery or your own, your own physical, uh, uh, physical machinations, if you will. And knowledge work has moved along over the last 60 years, certainly personal productivity with the introduction of the personal computer and, you know, mobile technology and other things have certainly turbocharged knowledge work. But what started to happen, Bob, gosh, I, I would argue close to a decade ago, but really has accelerated in the last four or five years, is this idea of the automation of knowledge work. Mm -hmm. And most of the application of this is around, you know, human plus machine, but it's the ability to automate small components of what you and I would historically have thought of as knowledge work. You could argue that search itself and search yeah. engines were a way of, you know, automating knowledge work. They seem commonplace today, 
but you'll well, well remember, I well remember the first time getting on to a search engine and it felt one step away from magic to me because mm -hmm. something that would have taken me weeks to research or having to bring people in or get colleagues to help me, I could do in a matter of seconds. And, and so I think we're going through a similar phase right now where some of these tools that allow us to start to automate knowledge work are really taking off. Now, automating knowledge work or aiding in the automation or um, the augmentation, let's call it, has been around for a little while. Generative AI is something really different and, and both kind of exciting, but perhaps a little frightening for a lot of people. So we've been automating or augmented human capability but now suddenly some of that augmentation or automation can be actually generative in nature. Mm -hmm. And this is where chat GPT comes in. And I, I think Bob, it is, um, you know, you and I have had the great fortune to, to literally have ringside seats at every major technology transition in the last, what, 25, nearly 30 years. And I, I shared with you before we went on, on, on air here, I feel like ChatGPT is one of the very few times that I've seen a new technology come on the scene that is both wildly overhyped and wildly underhyped at the exact same time. And the only other two times I've seen this, Bob, was the introduction of the browser-based internet in the mid 90s and or early 90s and the introduction of the iPhone in 2007. Tony, so, uh... You know, I I like the way you threaded those pieces together, but could you talk about? Um, you know, we, we we've all seen lots and lots of things that have been overhyped, you know, to the point of uh, nausea in some cases. So, how is Chat GPT in your mind being both overhyped and underhyped? I think the application of the technology in terms of its immediate use is overhyped right now. And, and that's not to say there aren't some very clever things that you can do with it. And if I would strongly encourage, as I've done in yeah. previous posts, and I've got a, a couple of things coming out on an acceleration um, economy.com to encourage particularly senior level business execs to get familiar with the technology. But it is it is not earth shattering today what you can do with it, mm -hmm. right? You can, you can uh, do some light brainstorming. You can do some light research. You could have... You know, if you and I decided, hey, um, what are hot topics that CEOs are dealing with around business technology? And we could do that three minutes before we went on this um, uh, Cloud Wars uh, podcast, and it would put together a coherent list of mm -hmm. topics based on that for us that we could use. And it would be relatable and usable very quickly. So there are some things that it's producing, but I think, Bob, the, the hue and cry that this is going to wholly replace journalists, wholly replace researchers. It's gonna replace you know, uh, human workforce very quickly mm -hmm. and it's gonna negatively impact humanity and it's gonna change the education system and all these types of things. I think that's premature. I'm not saying those things couldn't happen, but I think that the overhype right now, Bob, is around the practical use of the technology today on the other side, I think it's underhyped from the standpoint that what Chad GPT, in my opinion, Bob, represents is similar to the browser-based internet and the iPhone. It's opening up mainstream use of a new technology, right? And, and in essence, if you think about this, this is a door opening for the average person to start to interact with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And and to not just interact with, but to use the power of yeah. artificial intelligence. Most of us have interacted with artificial intelligence, but we've been on the receiving end. Mm -hmm. We're not actually driving anything. We're on the other end of a chat bot or the uh, uh, other end of a data analytics that was generated by, by AI. This represents something different. So my sense long-windedly, Bob, is the overhyped is the impact it's having today or will have in the near-term future. The underhype is the impact this will have over time. And I'm, I'm not a predictor of time frames, but I think this will have a um, remarkable impact, primarily because the data that we're putting into the system and the familiarity we're generating 
will accelerate the development of these types of platforms in this underlying technology itself. Yep. Yeah. Um, Tony, I, I think that's well said. Uh, the other thing, and I don't know in with human beings, if this is self-preservation or something, you know, a defense mechanism that comes up right away, we start to think, well, you know, uh, I could have done that myself, or I don't need the help of these or that. But we 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 tend to look at this, and I think it's part of your both overhyped and underhyped. It's like, oh, well, there's Chat GPT. Instead of thinking, yeah, if you can do that with uh, what Chat GPT does, what about if there's something that you know works in the video realm? You know, can we start to do that? Could we start? What if it is, uh, you know, if you'd hear about a couple school districts that have developed the ways you know, the ultimate blend in an optimal way for students, not for teachers, but for students to be able to use this in certain ways. And I think, Tony, the the generational impact that uh, you have talked about and others have, and Chris Lockhead talks about this a great deal, there's a new wave of people coming on, then they'll think of chat GPT like, well, yeah, of course. I mean, this is we, we yeah. this, and then there'll be the next one and the next one and the next one. So maybe that plays a little bit into your underhype thing of saying, if, you know, it's really stirred things up over the past two months, the whole two months that it's been out, just think what, you know, could be the case for a year from now, a couple of years from now, and that businesses who want to try to appeal to and engage with and sell to um, both this younger generation, but lots of other people as well had better understand that this is how a lot of people are going to start to look at the world and, and uh, their expectations are going to change in some pretty remarkable ways. But Bob, I, I 100% agree with you. And I think if you, you and I have talked about this many, many times during the course of our, our uh, friendship, technological change always precedes cultural change. Mm -hmm. And I, I would suggest that's exactly what you just said. And whether that's generational in nature so that there's less baggage, Younger people just, yeah, I don't know any different. I'm a digital native. This just seems intuitive that it would go this direction for me, right? Or not. The fact of the matter is these technologies get introduced. And then what happens is people learn how to use them in ways that fundamentally change the culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I would put chat GPT in one of those categories. Yeah, I think it will be remembered as one of those categories. And I, I really love where you're going. I, I'm a huge proponent that, um, education needs to evolve far faster than it really is. I don't think we serve general students particularly well, fundamentally, and I'm not picking on anybody, but most school systems are operating the same way they did in the 1940s. And, and we're really not seeing technology being used in ways that can augment and aid in the education of students. And, and I emphasize the education of students because so many of us learn differently. And I think technology can provide so so much value here. And I think of chat GPT. Now, granted, there's a downside. Is there in, is with any new technology, is it possible people, we're seeing examples of people could write term papers and other things. Our, uh, our mutual friend, Sean Amirati, who's a professor at Carnegie Mellon, they are both huge uh, researchers around generative AI, but he also said it's causing professors to stop and go, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait a second, who, who wrote this paper and yeah. how was this written and, and those yeah. types of things. And I don't mean to ignore that, but boy, you think of the implications for generative AI to help us and understand in education and, you know, really augmenting, you know, human teachers and, and other people out there. I 100% agree with you, Bob. I think the applications, we're just beginning to even wonder what the applications of this type of technology could be and in what fields. Well, Tony, you know, the I saw the other day, maybe it was just today, I, I'm not sure, but uh, Microsoft was describing, okay, we are on the, we, we're just announcing the third sort of stage of our partnership with OpenAI, yeah. which is the creator of ChatGPT. And uh, you know, just in in that respect, they're saying we're sort of moving it from, you know, uh, inside the Microsoft Cloud, the capabilities that are built there. We're putting up tools now to help developers do more and more things with uh, 
generative AI in general or chat GPT or some of the stuff that open AI is developing. And you know, you can imagine the way things go here. You said technology proceeds cultural as that sort of bumps its way down. There will be a point yeah. when, you know, our children in your case in mine, perhaps our grandchildren will just sit down and they'll be, uh, they will be mainstream, you know, low code, no code developing AI powered tools and absolutely every, a part of their everyday yeah. lives. Um, so I I have a little bit of sympathy, I think, for the teachers, professors worried about, hey, who wrote this thing and who developed yeah. it? But uh, plagiarism has been around for a long time. <laughs> this Very might long be a little time. simpler, but I suspect somebody's going to take, you know, the uh, what would be tiny a chat GPT sniffer and, the, and you know, uh, launch that as a product to absolutely. To so, you know, I, I think this is going to kick open a, just an extraordinary wave of innovation. But, Tony, incumbent on uh, business leaders, as they think about these two things, like, wow, we've got these new things coming in the technology, particularly around AI and machine learning, incredibly fast. And they're going to be monumental in their disruptive ability. The knowledge worker category is going to change in some ways. What uh, counsel would you offer to business leaders about you know how do you how do you cope with this in some ways and then beyond coping how do you get out in front and uh, take full yeah. advantage of it? Yeah, and Bob, I'll call people's attention to you know our our acceleration economy dot com platform because there's so much you know being being you know videos being produced and, and insights and and posts about it. And I've got. A couple that are coming up. One's a video, and the others a, a post on this exact topic. I think first off, my advice to senior executives is: don't wait. Start preparing now. And it, preparing doesn't mean you have to have a you know a plan and a four point you know structure for how to deal with this. But dive in. Start experimenting with this technology. Put a task force together to understand the implications of it research it you know if if need necessary bring in some folks from outside that might counsel you about what this is all about because you also realize chad gpt and this acceleration of artificial intelligence this redefinition of, of knowledge work bob is also happening in in the kind of post pandemic world where we're not sure is do we live in a remote world is it hybrid work how about those office mandates uh, i don't know i'm not so sure those are really working and so I think there's been, you know, there's the disruption of a post-pandemic workforce. Now there's this disruptive technology coming on the scene that has the potential to further disrupt what we think of as knowledge work. So long way back to the point, Bob, I think step one is, you know, really take the time to understand to the extent that you can what's happening here. I think over time, developing um, policies for usage understanding how it might apply to your business. I think there's a huge productivity gain from understanding these technologies and learning how to deploy them in your company. I would counsel senior executives not to, to get greedy too quickly. I think oftentimes we look at these emerging technologies and we see dollar signs and we think, oh my gosh, you know, we're going to automate this over here, which means we don't have to do that over there, mm -hmm. all these types of things. And then we learn over time that these are augmented technologies that are actually accelerating what human beings can do. You've seen this, Bob, you've studied it as well. We saw this in the automation of factories, particularly in the automotive industry, mm -hmm. that they started to, to, the pendulum swung too far into the almost employee-less version of an automated factory. And it didn't work as well, particularly in most automobiles are semi-custom today. And so the human plus machine started to come back into the workplace inside these factories. And I think we'll see a very similar dynamic here. I would just caution people, this isn't some remarkable thing where machines are gonna replace all these human beings and all those types of things. I do think that business leaders need to prepare, however, for um, where mundane knowledge work is happening and there's higher value knowledge work. And what I mean by higher value is preparing workers to make decisions, to pay, preparing workers to be innovative, preparing workers to solve problems. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at what a lot of knowledge work that, that you, know, you and I can name, and if you study this by really deeply diving into companies, 
a tremendous amount of, of it is pretty mundane. It's filling in, you know, cells on a spreadsheet. It's, you know, retrieving information that could be easily retrieved by a machine. It's, it's really a lot of, you know, frankly, almost manual work being done on a computer that is not particularly high value. It's kind of mind numbing work. And so I think that other thing I would say to senior level executives is training and preparing a workforce to up level problem solving and creativity and innovation. And, and a lot of that's gonna really come from understanding the business and understanding customer needs and getting out of what you think of as sort of task list sort of function in knowledge work into higher value knowledge work that's directly connected with customers and revenue and problem yeah. solving. Yeah. Um, Tony, I love that point about, uh, you know, the, 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 the culture there to get to understand it, the need to do that. And I want to, uh, if we could uh, just one final question, I'd like to toss out your way. Do you see that sort of approach uh, you know, this need for leaders to encourage and develop the, uh, programs and somewhere co-create, you know, along with people throughout the organization, at least create the opportunity for these new sort of learnings to take place. It seems to me there'd be a powerful correlation between that and the rise of a data culture with inside, uh, within organizations, right? They've got to be able to do in some ways, both of these things simultaneously. If you think about it, Bob, your, your point's a great one. You know, the, the way to to provide higher value and knowledge work, the path forward is, is through data. Yeah, it, it's it's to be able to take existing data and perhaps spend less time gathering data yeah. and more time analyzing, or perhaps more time understanding the insights that might be hidden in the data. Yeah. And I think that's where this gets really interesting. If you think about generative AI, people's first step is to think of plagiarism, but the reality of it is you're talking about generating insights. And if I could have an assist, so, you know, going through terabytes of data, a system could help me identify the top 10 insights that reside in the data. Boy, talk about higher value where I could apply, you know, my, my, my skills and those types of things. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and we cover this a lot, Bob, as you know, this, this movement of what people refer to as data modernization. The reason we do is it is the path forward for business model transformation, vaunted digital transformation that people, if they still use that terminology, you don't know what to transform unless you have the data. You don't know what customer needs are unless you have the data. You don't understand changes in your supply chain or transitions that you need to react to unless you have the data. And increasingly, something you noted earlier, Bob, that data is real time. Yeah. It's not, you know, the, the days of, Boy, we sit back with a quarterly market share report and hey, how'd we do? <laughs> you know, boy, did we gain a point or lose it? Oh, okay, well, we'll get them next quarter. Those days are long gone. You know, this is this is real-time data that people are reacting to. And I think that's implicit in your observation that this is about the data as it's always been. But I think what we're seeing is perhaps a step change in our ability to work through massive amounts of data and glean real insights that are actionable for knowledge workers. Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony, I, I have to say, as you're describing that, um, you know, the, that that real sort of new flexibility that leaders have to have in helping to, uh, if not directly shape, well, they have to shape the culture, but they've also got to enable the development yeah. within the organization of the right sort of culture. But I just, I, I was trapped thinking about, um, you know, this was this was not a couple of years ago, but a couple of decades ago, you know, you'd hear about some company that just went public and, uh, oh, they filed their S1 registration statement with the SEC. Well, the process then was you would call some company somewhere in around Washington, D.C., and they would send somebody over to an SEC office where public files were available, and they would get that, and they'd print out a copy of it and take it to the post office. And then there was this thing called Federal Express, and, you know, you got to pay us up front for this person, the courier, the FedEx thing, and all that. And then a day or two later, you'd get this bundle of paper in there, and it was like that was that was your peek behind the curtain, and uh, yeah. 
it wasn't that long ago. So um, it, in some ways it was, but as we think about the process or the capability of what that was and how limited that is relative to us now, I just want to always encourage people, think where we are today and imagine one or two years from now. I, I, I think it'll be hard to recognize. Oh man, back in early 23, they were still doing this. So that's where I think, you know, Tony, all the great points you've made here is to help uh, organizations be more alert, attuned to these things. What you did in the past and how you perfected a process is great. What you really want to get to be good at is, as you pointed out, seeing these emerging patterns before they become patterns and then yeah. uh, assessing what's the opportunity in here for me to either get better as an organization or to create something that customers are going to be intrigued by and perhaps love. Well, Bob, I'll save it for, for the next time we get together. But yeah. implicit in your observation there is the potential disruption of yeah. some industries that that you know we could we could name. You know, imagine you and I are presiding over a company about to go public, and we ask ourselves the question of, hey, of the last 500 successful IPOs, what did they have in common? Well, Today, we pay an investment bank a tremendous sum of money to synthesize some sort of insight there and guide us and come on meetings with us and all that kind of stuff. Could be in the near term future. That might be a little easier than it is today. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Tony, this is great. Always fun chatting with you. Thanks for a look at, uh, you know, some emerging um, trends and emerging, um, you know, priorities that I think executives need to take forward to help be uh, on pace with or maybe get a little ahead of some of these remarkable changes and disruptions that are happening. Bob, always great, my friend. Look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Thanks, Tony. And folks, thanks to all of you for being with us here at Cloud Wars Live. Hope things are uh, going well for you as 2023 kicks off. And uh, we'll see what's next in the whole uh, world of generative AI, other things and other disruptive practices as we go forward. See you soon.